Hello and welcome to the Investor Financing Podcast. And I'm your host, Bo Eckstein. And on our continued interview series, we're always looking for talented guests to bring on the show to provide value to our viewers and listeners. Uh, today, we have Victor Manesh. He's the author of Magnetic Capital. He is the host of the Daily Real Estate Espresso Podcast. For his day work, he is a principal with Y Street Capital, where he specializes in development of new construction, multifamily apartments, assist, assisted living, land development, industrial, and workforce housing in several markets across North America. Welcome to the show, Victor. Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. All right. So let's let's get in um, about, I know you have a tech background, and 10-ish years ago, you got into real estate. What attracted you to real estate? How'd you get your start in real estate? Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, I started my career as a microprocessor designer, definitely not the typical career path into the world of real estate development. And, you know, frankly, that was some of the most fun I've had in my life, you know, designing microprocessors, working with crazy smart people, all kinds of weird and wonderful applications. Uh, you know, I started my career in the mid 80s designing processors for communication systems. 52% of the phone calls in North America were routed through a chip that I designed for about a decade and then went on to do all kinds of other different applications, uh, seatback displays on most Airbus aircraft that show the movies. That's a processor that I was involved with. Uh, Pachinko patchy slot machines in Japan with Sammy Sega and NVIDIA and Patriot Missile and all kinds of different, you know, Hewlett Packard storage networks, different applications all over the world. And uh, time was about 2008. Uh, we were working with a cellular carrier in Japan, the number four carrier in Japan, building a new cellular network. And I was literally shuttling back and forth between my home here in Ottawa, Canada, and Tokyo every two weeks. And I, you know, I got a lot of free frequent flyer miles. That was that was a nice fringe benefit, but it was burning me out physically, emotionally. It wasn't the right thing for me, and it wasn't the right thing for my family. So at that point, I resigned my position as VP of engineering and made the decision to take a hard left turn in my career and to move into the world of real estate investing on a full-time basis. And of course, if you remember, something happened around 2008 that kind of created the opportunity of a lifetime for, for new entrants. So that's, that's how it happened. Yeah, that's a good point to say new entrants because I was in the market and I uh, got pretty slaughtered hammered <laughs> so so yeah i, I think yeah. you know there was a great it was an amazing time to you know have capital or the ability to raise capital at that point in time i mean just if i think if we look back and just the opportunities that have i mean the the, the millions of people that have created wealth uh during that period of time because because real estate was at, at the biggest discount that I've seen. I mean, I'm in here in Las Vegas. I remember prices on uh, residential properties were dropped down like 60%, yeah. maybe even more. And uh, now if, across the US, I can speak to the market has come back and it's crazy now, uh, limited inventory, uh, huge demand. And I keep on thinking in the back of my mind, cause I, I saw the downturn of 2007, eight, and I'm thinking, God, when is this going to stop? Because I would have thought that the 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 uh, the craziness would have stopped, but it's gotten crazier with the pandemic. And I'm trying to really figure out, OK, we have a shortage of inventory. So, you know, what really can happen? I know we're going through in, a huge inflation right now. We got a re recession on the horizon. But but all in all, I think real estate is probably still the place to put your money. Um, so I want to kind of talk about your investing strategy right now. Um, you, you've got your hands in assisted living, multifamily, uh, industrial workforce housing, which I think we need workforce housing for sure. I mean, that's everybody needs. And uh, multifamily, there's probably not enough units to cover the demand. Um, so what's your kind of What's your process right now for analyzing deals and, and what markets and why and what do you what do you see happening over the next five years if you got your crystal ball out? My view of real estate is that it's hyper local. It doesn't matter what's happening in the macro economy, there will always be markets that in a down market, the local conditions can be the opposite. For example, in the downturn post 2008, 
like you said, Vegas went down 60%. You know, parts of Maricopa County were way down. You remember those days, the $99 move-in special? Uh, there was so much inventory available, and you could literally buy things for a third of construction costs, so it didn't make sense to build. I created conditions where there was a lot of, at least five years of pent-up demand for new product that just wasn't being built. And that's kind of responsible for the situation that we have today because there was so much pent-up demand. We look for markets where there's influx of population, influx of jobs. We want to see uh, an excess of demand and a shortage of supply, and we want to see those conditions persist for a good long time. So we will not invest, for example, in shrinking markets. Uh, a lot of people have invested in communities like Detroit, but if you look at Detroit, it's lost half its population from the 1970s. There's a reason you could buy houses for so little, because there was just more supply than demand. Yeah, you could rent them out, and you, you could make the numbers work in an Excel spreadsheet, but there was more supply than demand. So that would violate our criteria. We would not go into a market like that. And, and I know there's others that disagree with me, and that's perfectly fine. I always want to see that upward pressure on demand. And uh, so you know, sometimes the market responds to that upward pressure and, and then you get this cycle happening where it gets overbuilt. We've seen that happen numerous times, for example, in Miami, where all of a sudden you get thousands of or tens of thousands of units surplus ahead of demand. It happened in 2007. It happened again uh, a couple of years ago. But guess what? That 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 inventory has been reabsorbed. So we want to see those markets where there's influx of population and uh, it's got to be able to support uh, new construction. That's you know one of the things that we, we like to see. That is what we specialize in. And, um, and so we love those markets. So today we've got about 600 units of new construction in our pipeline across several markets uh, and a couple of thousand acres of land in uh, again across several markets well, let's talk about magnetic capital what the book's about and it, it it sounds like that you have a tremendous experience raising capital and i have a feeling magnetic capital is a book that helps people understand how to attract the money is that accurate it is and what i learned how to raise capital in the tech industry and i, I can tell you you know hand on heart the hardest thing to do is to go to an investor with an idea and say, you know, just give me the money, I'll develop the company, I'll develop the market, uh, it'll be great. That's the hardest thing to do, even for a small amount of money. Whereas in the world of real estate, you have a, you have a developed market, you've got market statistics, you can be a fast follower, you don't have to be a trailblazer, you don't have to be a hero, you can just do what the market is already delivering. And when you do, uh, it, it's much more predictable. The basic principles of raising capital, uh, you know, when I transitioned from the tech industry into real estate, I, I kind of did it the wrong way. I started spending my own money, and of course, the real estate investing is a game of big dollars, and eventually everybody runs out of their own cash. So then I had to rediscover how to raise capital in real estate, and when I did, I discovered that the process was exactly the same. And that the, if there's... A set of principles involved and if you obey those principles raising money is easy and if you violate any one of those principles all of a sudden raising money becomes extraordinarily difficult um, so just briefly those there's five principles number one you have to have a relationship with the money and, I, and I'm not talking about networking or anything utilitarian I'm talking about genuine relationship number two you have to establish trust uh, and the psychological contract of trust is complex. It's not just are you dealing with an honest individual. It's it's deeper than that. Are you you have to answer a whole series of questions like, can I trust you to put together a good plan? Can I trust you to execute the plan? Can I trust you to communicate in an open and transparent way? Can I trust you with my money? And on and on and on. And if any one of those things is missing, it erodes the trust. Number three, you've got to have a track record. And if you don't have a track record, you get caught in this catch-22, this circular argument that says, well, how can I raise any money if I don't have any track record? And how can I get a track record if I can't raise any money? I'm stuck. And a lot of people think that. But if you do, you're thinking about it the wrong way. Remember, this is a team sport. It's not like your grade three math test 
that if you collaborate with your partner, you're cheating. This is a team sport. So if you don't have that ex experience base in you personally, go partner with someone who does. Uh, and I've done that throughout my entire career. Uh, you know, don't, don't have too much ego around you've got to be the guy uh, or gal working on this. You've got to find the right people, bring that experience base into your team so that you can legitimately borrow from that experience because it's now part of your team. Then number four, you've got to have a compelling opportunity. And this is where most people start. They think, I've got a deal. And, you know, and they're just out there peddling deals and it's never about the deal. But yeah, it's got to be a compelling opportunity. And then finally, uh, you've got to have alignment between the goals for the money and the goals for the project. And if that alignment doesn't fit, it's like a pair of shoes. You know, you can go to the store and you can see the most beautiful pair of shoes and they're on sale this week. But if they don't fit, you're not a buyer. It doesn't matter how beautiful they are or how deeply discounted they are. But if they don't fit, you're not a buyer. So you've got to have all of those five elements. And if they're all in place, raising money is remarkably easy. Yeah, that's great. That's a great explanation of it. Uh, yeah, I can understand get, getting started. Like I, for example, I've never syndicated a deal. Have I had investors in my deals? Yes, as, as debt, you know, they were a first mortgage, a first deed of trust. I don't do huge projects, but um, that was my stepping stone into raising capital. Uh, I haven't done a syndication. Um, I have a lot of friends and colleagues in the industry that raise millions and millions of dollars. And it's fascinating. Probably some Sometime in my career, I will do it. Um, but uh, right now, it's more of the kind of smaller. They're a they're a they're a lender on the deal, and it may, it's easy that way, right? To get your get your feet wet. Whereas some people just started in huge deals and raising money and so forth. But I liked what you said about partnering up, right? Um, I see that a lot happening on on capital raises too, and somebody brings one piece, like the experience or the de development piece. Somebody else will bring in, um, maybe one of the GPs will be uh, the signer because their net worth or whatever. So uh, that's a really good concept. I see a lot of um, co-GPs going on. And I think that's kind of, and I like what you said about kind of partnering to get that experience because that's that's kind of how you get into, like if you want to get a multifamily loan and get agency debt, for example, you have to have experience. So if you didn't have the experience, you would need to get a uh, co-GP or a, a, a signer to, to, to uh, come on board with you. So on most of your transactions, I guess it varies on, on whether, um, what kind of deal it is, right? If it's an assisted living, do you have kind of strategic partners in each kind of uh, food group that you're investing in? We do, we do. I mean, for example, assisted living, is one of those businesses that's structured to look like a real estate project. And if obviously there's a real estate component, but it's first and foremost a service business. So the operator is the key, uh, and, and the operator and their ability to attract the right staff. In fact, uh, you know, we just finished a project in, uh, in Louisiana and incidentally, we, we won the senior housing news architectural and design award for 2021 it was just announced in the middle of december so it was kind of nice to get that recognition on a national basis for that particular project but but that particular project was really all about developing a, almost a new class of assisted living where the traditional big box facilities are i call, I call them a hospital with a better paint job you know if you've lived your entire life in a house, you don't want to be in a box on the sixth floor. You want to live in more in that home-like setting, and that's what we've built. We built we built campuses of assisted living care homes where you get the economies of scale of a large facility with the intimacy of a single-family home environment. So, all of our care homes have a maximum of 16 beds. Our caregiver ratio, as opposed to being you know, 12 to 1, 15 to 1, 30 to 1 at night. Our caregiver ratios are like 5.3 to 1. So we put our, we, we design the real estate so that it's appropriate for what the residents really need. We put more of the budget towards care because that's why they're there. They don't need the pottery classes and the underwater treadmills and 
all of that other stuff, that doesn't get used. It attracts people, but it doesn't get used. It's not why they're there. Uh, so, you know, we put, put the dollars to where it's really required. And it just requires a deep understanding of what the product needs to be for your specific customer. And one of the things that really served me very well coming from the microprocessor industry is having that product design mindset. And I really take that with me. I carry it with me every day. doesn't matter what it is, whether it's land development or senior housing or condos or whatever. It's always through the lens of product development, designing a product for a specific customer. And so, so if I heard you correctly, it's um, you're building kind of, it's like a 16 bed. Uh, is it like a single level? Can you kind of explain yes. it? Okay, single level. And you're doing like a... I guess you would say it's a boutique instead of like a hundred, 200 beds. You're doing six, like a, like it's, is this almost like, um, Oh no, it's still, it's still like a hundred beds, but it's oh, a it's campus. A, okay. So, it, so, so it's a campus of care homes uh -huh. with a separate admin building with all, you know, with the, the executive director and the head of nursing and, uh, having their office in the admin building and, and all the maintenance staff are there. So you still have all of the things that you would expect to see in a larger scale facility. You've got, you know, an activities director and a, and a driver and all of those things that you would expect to see. But now it's distributed. These are single level homes. You're not putting people through elevators and all of that sort of thing. There's a kitchen in each home. Residents crowd, everyone loves a kitchen party. And so the residents all love to eat breakfast or lunch not in the dining room they want to sit at the island in the kitchen it's amazing so um and it was that like a ratio of AL, uh, alf or assisted living with memory care or is it just straight assisted living we have both products so some other care homes are assisted living they obviously have more uh, physical security so people don't wander off because people with dementia have a a, a tendency to do that you're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Hello, Bo Eckstein here, host of the Investor Financing Podcast. Are you a lender, real estate professional, or vendor that provides products or services within the real estate investing and business owner space? We are offering a few sponsorship opportunities to get in front of a highly targeted audience. If you're interested, please click the link below for further information. We look forward to talking with you. Thanks. Make it a great day. Again, each home is uh, positioned slightly differently as a different product offer. We have a more base level offering that's at one price point. We have a luxury offering. We've got memory care. And that particular approach allows you to do different product positioning. You could do, for example, if you wanted, you could do a Parkinson's home. You could do uh, a kosher house. Uh, you know, so you can start to segregate things even on dietary on a dietary basis. Um, that and and that's easier to do in in that more intimate setting. You're not serving food cafeteria style on mass on steamer trays uh, like you would be in a big box facility. It's really much more customized. Oh, very, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, if I was at that age, well, it's usually the kids making the decisions or helping right. the, you know, so the kids, like they have kind of a guilt factor because they don't want the parent living with them uh, most of the time, right? In certain cultures, people, but in America, I could speak to, about America, people want their parents living <laughs> in assisted care because they don't, in other cultures, you see more like, uh, people that they bring their parents in, but that doesn't happen here in, in the U.S. Probably not You have Canada to look either. at it. Yeah, you have to look at it in terms of what the needs are because there's a spectrum, um, you know, with independent living at one end of the spectrum and skilled nursing at the other end of the spectrum. And you look at the six basic human functions, you know, can you feed yourself? Can you bathe yourself? Can you use the bathroom on your own? Can you get dressed on your own? Can you take your medicines and so on? And depending on how many of those you can do without assistance determines w whether you're a category for one or another. And at a certain point, you know, when you're really talking about round the clock care, the, the, the term caregiver burnout is very real. 
you know. So families on their own really are not equipped to provide that level of care in all instances. And mom or dad are better off in an assisted living or perhaps even a skilled nursing facility. Now, there's some really poor ones out there. We, you know, we've done the secret shopper thing. We've looked at what the competition is in the market. And it's shocking to see the quality of care that's out there on a large scale. We've, in, in this particular facility that we just finished, we're well ahead of, ahead of our leasing curve. And frankly, we're stealing market share. Um, because people are often people that come into our facility are not coming because of an event because all of a sudden they need more help most of the time they're coming from a big box facility and they hated it so we're often getting people that have already made the transition but now they they they're really coming to where they belong well yeah I, all the research I've done uh, they talk about the silver the silver tsunami how many uh boom, baby boomers are turning 65 it's so the the demands there for the next 20 30 years without question there's a shortage of inventory in that category as well i mean that's just... right now there's not a shortage in most markets most major markets are actually oversupplied which is kind of interesting because the average age of people entering assisted living is well into the 80s and if you think about the oldest baby boomer today they're not that they're not that old yet they're in their 70s so that wave is coming but there's still another decade to go so if you've overbuilt in the market that's a bit of a land grab you know hoping to get market share in advance of that uh, and a lot of people are doing that a lot of developers have been doing that but there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity in particular in secondary and tertiary markets and even in primary markets if you have a differentiated offering such as what we have for example, we've been very successful in Dallas. My partner, Lo Hornbuckle, runs the Say Joke in Dallas. And even though the Dallas market is oversupplied, he's full uh, because he has that differentiated product to offer. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I do see a, it's a, like a developers galore are getting in or in that space. And so the, the, the real thing is, is, is the niche. The niche is yep. where you where you like. And, and that makes sense because... Um, you know, if you're putting your parents somewhere, you're going to put them in a place that's going to, they're going to make them happy, even if it costs a little bit more. But to, for your parents, you're going to do what it takes to, to get, to get them in the, in the right. So your, your, your facilities are not, uh, they're, they're private pay. They're not. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. The number one cost in any of these facilities is labor and, you know, attracting the right quality of labor a lot of people you know look at a facility and they say oh gee whiz that's expensive you know six grand a month or you know fill fill in whatever number you want they say that's expensive and and it it can be for a lot of families absolutely on the flip side three shifts of round the clock care in your own home is going to be triple that so on the one hand it looks expensive but on the other hand it's actually a bargain compared with the alternatives if indeed you're if your folks need that round the clock care and at a certain point some do so it it seems expensive but on the other hand it's actually a bargain and the you know like i said the number one cost is is the staff that that is what drives the the whole economic model so if you have uh, you know if your affordability point is 2500 a month uh, well guess what um, you're not going to be getting great care it's really not going to be a great experience. It doesn't matter, you know, what color the paint is on the walls or how big the room is. You're, that's not why you're there. You're there for the, the, the quality of the care. So, you know, we built the Say Joke on a very, three very simple principles. Better care, better food, and better communication. Those three. Um, and, and, and that's what we live and die by uh, literally every day with, uh, COVID and, and, um, supply chain issues and government in, in the U S printing money. Mm -hmm. What is your team looking at right now? As far as what's going on, what's your outlook for the next five years? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but you know, how are you, uh, protecting yourself of construction costs and all this stuff that's all these factors right now especially in the development game, I guess right now you're creating inventory, which is good. Mm -hmm. We know there's demand for the right uh, housing or assisted living type of product. But um, 
you know, what's your outlook over the next few years with what's going on in the in the world and and you know, um, obviously, long term, usually real estate. Uh, people need a place to live. People need uh, assisted care. We we know that, but how are you kind of looking at the next couple of years, kind of uh, from your take as a developer? Again, we're looking at those markets where there is that influx of population. So we want to see that upward pressure on demand. And in those market conditions, you know, the market does segment between new product and older product. If you just look at the averages, it kind of obscures the reality. You might you might be in a market. I'll give you a very good example. Um, it's it's not a market that we're active in, but it's one that we're looking at. Huntsville, Alabama, is a growing market. Traditionally, their rents were in around a dollar ten, a dollar fifteen a square foot. Those numbers don't support new construction. It, they just don't. You've got to be at least, even if your land cost is very low, you've got to be at least a dollar sixty, maybe a dollar seventy a square foot to support new construction. Uh, so, and that's a pretty big gap between a dollar ten and a dollar sixty. Now you've got new automobile plants coming in there. You've got Honda. You've got Mazda. Like you've got all of this growth. So. If you're going to build, will people pay what it co what it costs to actually afford an assist um, uh, afford new product? And what's bearing out in that marketplace is that yes, new product is getting built, it is getting filled at those price points that make sense, and it is pulling putting pressure upward pressure on existing inventory, so that those market averages, even for some of the older product, are now in the dollar thirty, dollar thirty five, dollar forty range. So the gap is closing. Uh, and and you see that in a lot of markets, you know, Nashville, tremendously growing market, 120 people a day moving into Nashville, uh, Boise, a lot of people moving from coastal markets into the into into some of those mountain regions. Uh, so uh, Spokane, Washington, another market that we're active in, uh, we've seen 35 percent rent growth in Spokane since the start of the pandemic. So there, it, it really just depends. You've got to look at it on a on a case by case basis. It's got to be very localized. And stress test it, right? Like yep. if you stress test it, it's going to take out a lot of the risk. If you're variables, I think a lot of uh, syndicators and so forth sometimes might not stress test. But I've always been taught stress test everything. You know, know your downside risk. What happens if you know the lease ups slow or vacancies drop? But that's good advice. That's good advice. So, um, tell me about a little bit more about Real Estate Espresso podcast. Um, what, what do you mostly talk about on that on that podcast? So, Real Estate Espresso podcast is a daily show, seven days a week. And when conceived of the show a few years ago, the thinking was that the the airways are already a little bit crowded. Let's face it; it's a little bit saturated. So. The average listener at the time, if they listen to podcasts at all, they typically subscribe to six and listen to five because that's all they have time for. So if they're going to listen to me, who am I going to kick out of their list of six? Am I going to kick out Oprah Winfrey or Tim Ferriss? Like, who, who am I going to kick out? And had to be realistic about that. So could I design a show that would compete without competing? So the Real Estate Espresso podcast is literally your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. The weekday shows are just me, five minutes, and then the weekend edition are interviews with notable people from the world of investing, economics, and marketing, and business, and so on. And so far, uh, you know, we're closing in on two million downloads. The show's doing well, and the feedback from the listeners is that they'll often listen to my show first, ahead of some of the more established shows, because they can commit to five minutes in the morning where they may not be able to commit to 45 minutes to an hour for one of the more established shows. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, at the end of the day, people are so busy now, they they don't have, unless the topic of the show is something they use, that's what I notice. I do better on YouTube than I do on my downloads because I don't know why, but it, so I focus mostly on YouTube, but I do have an audio component of my show. So, uh, but I, I've been doing it for several years and it's, I'm not a huge whale in the space but i get a lot of people reaching out and that's why i do this to help people because you know my my day job is financing so you know if people like what i say they might reach out and i can help them 
you know, buy more property or, or refinance and save money, whatever it is. And then I interview people like yourself just to talk about real estate investing, uh, development, and just learn about what people are doing, right? Like where, what's their focus? So we have people in the assisted living space, in the multifamily space, in the short-term rental space. So I, I like it because I always learn something, right? So it's kind of a selfish thing to do, but also it's a very good way to learn about uh, the market, you know, not only real estate, but the global market in general. Um, but really appreciate you coming on the show. What's what's the best way for people to find out more about you if they're not familiar with you? You can connect with me through my website at victorjm.com. So very straightforward, victorjm.com. Uh, the Real Estate Espresso podcast can be accessed there or through whatever platform you listen to podcasts on, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher. We're on more than 20 different platforms. And um, love if you're interested in raising capital, uh, definitely go out, grab a copy of Magnetic Capital. Uh, please buy the book. I need the money. And <laughs> we'll be happy to help help you in that way as well. Very good. Well, I appreciate it. I'm going to get a copy of your book too and uh, look look forward to reading it. And uh, next time we have you on the show, it'd be great because we can share screens if we could walk through uh, maybe a assisted living facility you guys developed uh, and do kind of a, a little case study if that's possible sure. in the future yeah. um, and what it looks like and high level overview. Our viewers love to see case studies and kind of what, what people are doing and so forth. But anyway, Thank you so much, and I, I'll uh, see everybody on the next episode.